So the first question that we have yeah. for Matt is uh, Mark 1 15 is a, just a fascinating verse where Jesus says the time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. Okay. So telling people to change their mind, to repent and to believe the gospel, it assumes that there are some different gospels out there. Uh, so what were some of the rival gospels in Jesus's day? Well, yeah, in Jesus's day, um, yeah, there were a number of rival gospels. Um, they weren't usually given the term gospel, though. Um, we occasionally see that language applied maybe to the big one that was the rival. Uh, but there were certainly like ways of life that were philosophically informed um, that were out there and that promised to deliver the good life. So they're similar to the Christian gospel in that way. Um, so we might think, for instance, of um, the philosophical school of, of the Epicureans, right, where they believed that the gods were distant. Uh, they weren't really particularly involved. And so what you really needed to do is you needed to find uh, what would be the good life and what would give you the most joy um, by um, eating and drinking well, commiserating with friends well, um, and not overindulging, not underindulging, finding the perfect kind of middle ground there uh, so that you are uh, maximized uh, your contentedness. Uh, but that's, all, that's obviously a little bit of a hollow party spirit uh, kind of life that would end up following um, with no kind of larger telos or purpose, right? Um, another rival school um, would be uh, Zeno's school that he founded, Stoicism. Um, that would promise to deliver the good life mainly by you overcoming life's circumstances, right? Uh, there's a kind of fatalism to stoicism that life is just going to flow a certain way and you need to learn how to go with the flow and to control your emotions in the midst of that. Otherwise, you're going to be unhappy. Obviously, there's some practical wisdom to that. Um, but again, um, we're looking uh, in the Christian story about a, a more holistic salvation um, that actually isn't just enduring the trials of life, but actively participating in the good mission that God gives us. Um, the biggest, though, rival um, that was out there was obviously Caesar uh, and Caesar's uh, rival claim to lordship, which was actually called a gospel in the ancient world. Uh, and Caesar promised to deliver all kinds of benefits, like he had delivered the benefit of the Pax Romana, right, the Roman peace, um, and uh, bringing an end to the time period of civil wars in Rome and giving people bread, right, sending out a bread dole uh, so that people would have their daily bread fix. Um, as part of that whole system, like Caesar made claims to being a savior uh, that would in interesting ways parallel the Christian claims. Uh, but obviously uh, Caesar proved to be at the end of the day, quite a tyrant uh, or the various Caesars uh, at the end of the day usually proved to be tyrants. So um, a, a, a quite distant from the good news of our Lord Jesus, the King. What are some rival gospels in our day found outside of our faith? Rival gospels outside of our faith today. Um, well, yeah, there are, are various ways we can think about that. Obviously, we can think about alternative religions, right? That would be one way. Those are probably not the biggest rivals for most people's hearts. Um, they're probably things we don't even consider religions. Um, something like scientific naturalism, right? Um, as science has given such a prominent role in our culture, and obviously we would all want to applaud science as being helpful, beneficial, delivering marvelous fruits to the world. Um, and uh, when we absolutize that, and we begin to claim that, well, the only thing that exists is science and what science can define for us, um, that can devolve into a kind of gross scientific naturalism, right? Where um, the claim would be made that only matter matters or that the only thing that exists are the things on the periodic table. Um, obviously, you're going to end up with a very impoverished view of life if you follow scientific naturalism, um, but it's not a coherent philosophy anyway, right? It makes claims that go beyond um, what it can support. For instance, scientific naturalists would tend to affirm the laws of science, like F equals MA and E equals MC squared, right? Um, these are things that actually don't have any mass, right? Um, um, these are propositions uh, that are mentally held. Um, science can't even explain um, something as fundamental as the basic difference between the brain and the mind, 
right? And um, things that are so important to science, like the, let's just say numbers, like the number three, the number nine, is there a place where physically I can finally reach out and touch that number? They seem to be something beyond that, like an abstract object. So it would be what philosophers call these things. Uh, most philosophers agree that abstract objects exist, but again, where do they fit within scientific naturalism? That would be one like rival worldview. I could talk about many more. Well, something that we bump up against a lot is um, progressivism. I would say that's a rival gospel. I just looked up, uh, there was an article on Pythios or how you say it, Pathios. There's a children's minister at this progressive Christian church. And with Easter coming up, she had some issues because she didn't want to teach that Jesus died for the children's sins because it might be psychologically damaging. She didn't want to teach that uh, God intended for, for Jesus to die um, and as the primary purpose of his life. She didn't want to teach that um, he saves us from judgment and hell because there's nothing bad in children to be saved that needs saving. And she didn't want to teach that coming back from the dead is something you expect. So at that point, I'm like, well, what is Easter anyway? Then <laughs> What are we celebrating? Yeah. So can you tell us um, if you were trying to summarize what the gospel is, what's the gospel? Yeah, the gospel is really the narrative about Jesus um, that really when we think about the whole Christian story to say that the gospel is like everything from creation to new creation is probably too big, right? It's really the focal point within that about, about um, Jesus's saving mission, right? That's where the focus of energy is. So if I was to be really precise in speaking about the gospel, I would say that the father sent the son who preexisted alongside God the father, that the son took on human flesh. And this was in fulfillment of the promises that God had made to David, that there would be an offspring born in his line, uh, that he lived a human life, right? And uh, as part of that uh, perfect human life, then he died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. He was buried, uh, which affirms that his death was real. Um, he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And again, the emphasis is on God uh, has, has announced these things in advance, right? That the death and resurrection don't come out of the blue, uh, but are part of God's plan and purposes that um, stretch um, from before time began uh, to, um, to uh, our horizon today. And uh, after he was raised on the third day, then he was seen by witnesses, again, affirming the reality of his resurrection. And then um, the thing that I think gets the most energy in the New Testament's presentation of the gospel is that after he was seen by these witnesses, he, was, uh, he ascended to the right hand of God the Father, where he's enthroned as the king. And that from that position, he rules. Um, and uh, as the king, then what does he do? He sends the Holy Spirit. Uh, so that he can apply the benefits of the gospel to his people, and that he'll come again. So um, I would say that's the gospel precisely, the story about Jesus and his saving actions. What parts of the gospel are under most uh, attack on the one hand, and then on the other hand are the most underemphasized? And those may be two different types of people. You know, one might be like, well, we don't believe that because it doesn't fit our uh, our best view of the world. But on the other hand, it may be people who are very well-meaning Bible-believing people who just underemphasize some very important parts of that. So what, what are some elements of the gospel that are most attacked? What are some elements that are most de-emphasized or under-emphasized? Yeah, let me start by the under-emphasized. I think that's easier. Um, and then I'll think about attacked. Um, for under-emphasized, I would say certainly like almost all the emphasis in gospel presentations classically uh, have focused the energy on the cross. Right. And we would we don't want to deny that the cross is of utmost importance, right, for understanding the gospel. But most of the energy has been around like forgiveness of sins, and that happens at the cross. So contemplating the atonement and that how we have right standing with God and and all that has been where most of the gospel energy has been. So the tendency has been to underemphasize other parts of the gospel. I think beyond the the cross, people talk about the resurrection as they're like, Oh yeah, that's gospel too. Um, but I think that what gets underemphasized is Jesus' kingdom right? That, that after that the cross and the resurrection are partly a prelude to the fact that Jesus is going to be installed at the right hand of the Father. And it's from that position that he supplies the benefits of the cross to us, right? As he sends the Holy Spirit to make effective the cross for the church. So when we forget that horizon of kingship, we're really leaving
leaving a lot out of the gospel. Uh, beyond that, obviously, Jesus' incarnation, right? The fact that he took on human flesh, um, that has enormous importance for understanding our salvation uh, because we need to see Jesus in his full humanity as the one who God establishes as the ruler of creation. Uh, and we need to learn to gaze upon him as the incarnate one, right? As that's partly how our own glory is restored. So it's a misunderstanding of salvation also to de-emphasize the incarnation. So I would say like really the enthronement of Jesus as king and the incarnation uh, get pretty badly neglected, I think, in the church when we think about what the gospel is. And, and you said glory, you said, uh, you use that word glory. And I just, I'm just curious, how would you frame glory as part of the you know, major backdrop for understanding the gospel in its fullness, the, the concept of glory? Yeah. So um, as humans are made in the image of God, right, um, that we have a derivative glory would be how I would want to speak about that. So that God is glorious and that as humans are made in his image, we have a participation or a share in that appropriate glory. But that glory gets distorted or defaced or fractured or fragmented as uh, we all participate in sin. So through the fall and our ongoing reenactment of the fall in our own life narrative, right, that glory that God intends to fill the earth with um, through his image bearers is fragmented so that it's not actually filling the earth in the way that God intends. So what we need is a restoration of the glory. And this all connects to the gospel. Paul speaks about actually the gospel in glory-laden terms in 2 Corinthians 4, 4 through 5, where he speaks about the gospel and says that it is the gospel of the glory of of Christ, the image of God. But yeah, that's how glory connects to um, really the gospel and God's purposes for us. And and how are some of those elements attacked culturally? Yeah, that's such a huge question. Um, you know, I think there are like, on the one hand, progressive att attacks that Renee mentions, right? That would be ones that seem to flat out want to deny the the historical value of like Christ's death for our sins, right? Wanting to say like, no, we don't really have a fundamental sin problem. That's not an optimistic enough view of humanity. Um, so there would be some problematic ideas that, um, that, that fail to take seriously our, our fallen human condition. Um, I, I think that's under attack today, but that's been under attack for a long time, right? Uh, we go back to, um, you know, the, the movement called deism, right? And in uh, the enlightenment and the, the sort of optimism within liberal theology that is really from 1650 to 1950, right, is a dominant theme. Um, so this isn't a new problem. So when I think about fresh attacks on the gospel proper, there would be some reductionistic ideas, I think, that are trying to maybe underplay um, the ways in which our, like God is meeting the sin problem that would be failing to see that God is, um, uh, that, that God has an appropriate wrath that is poured out on humanity um, because of the sin problem. There would be you know, attempts within some gospel presentations uh, to fundamentally deny that because it would be seen as divine child abuse or something like that, that how could God, um, God's wrath be poured out on Jesus as a father on a son? Isn't that some sort of form of abusive relationship? Um, so I think our current culture has problems with certain kinds of ways of speaking about um, the substitutionary dim dimensions of the atonement that are probably under attack. But at the same time, some of those ideas do need to be sharpened or we need to be very nuanced in how we speak about um, about such matters. A woman that I uh, is in my D group and she's a college professor at a state university. And she um, she's a believer and she's a scientist. She's a neuroscientist. So she's uh, kind of an anomaly and not only in her department, but at her university. And she said, you know, when she is able to share her faith with her students, they get tripped up about this penal substitutionary atonement stuff. Like they, they don't like it. It's off-putting. And so she's wrestling with how can I, I, I want to, I want to embrace that concept, but how can I reach people who are so far from God in a way that's winsome, that'll draw them, draw them near. Do you have advice for somebody like that? Who's, who's like, you know, it, it is part of the gospel, <laughs> but, but can we come at it from a different angle initially, I guess, is what I'm wondering. 
Yeah, certainly. I mean, we're free to come at it from lots of different angles. Um, we're not free to dispense with those ideas, as you well know and uh, would agree. Um, but um, yeah, we certainly could come at it from an angle of incarnation, right? Talking about, for instance, um, how God wants to begin to restore the glory and that that's actually a communal process and that we can see the brokenness in the world around us. And that as we gaze upon Jesus, like we kind of mutually edify and build one another up in that glory of the Lord so that we begin to refill the earth with his glory. That's in a perfectly fine place to start with somebody who's tripped up over some other subtleties. Right. Yeah. Um, but I think uh, at the same time, um, we can also think about like how we're presenting the model of atonement. Like we don't need to lead out with penal substitutionary atonement as if that's the most important dimension of atonement, right? Um, I think it's actually biblically true to say that Christ's victory over all evil powers is, is really probably the best context or the largest framework for the atonement so that we're understanding like he's victor victorious over the demons. He's victorious over death. He's victorious over tyrants. He's victorious over the tyranny of our own selves, right? Um, and that understanding that within that larger category of Christ's victory, like uh, substitutionary atonement, uh, has a, a, an appropriate place and understanding, right? What's 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 transpired in Christ's actions on our behalf, but it it doesn't have to be the largest framework. And I think biblically speaking, it in fact probably isn't the largest framework. That can help too. That's really helpful. I'm gonna be sure she watches this. <laughs> yes, that's excellent. I mean, it really is, and I. I know all that, but I hadn't thought of it in terms of um, presenting it um, in this really large victory over darkness, victory over evil in every aspect of creation, not just human, human fallenness. That's huge because a, a lot of people would see God as being kind of petty when he seems to only care about personal internal sin. And, uh, you know, if, if we're dealing only in kind of a, a narrower view of of, uh, of atonement, we might, you know, we might lose sight of the bigger picture of glory and restored creation. And um, so I, I could see how, you know, the, the full view of the gospel actually makes uh, God seem much less petty. Would you agree with that? I mean, am I, am I thinking rightly there? Yeah, you are. Um, and I think that, yeah, the like ideas of substitutionary atonement focus on one side of salvation. That's like salvation from, like we need salvation from sin. We need salvation from ourselves too, as part of that, right? Um, from our own misguided self-rule, but it misses that salvation is for something, right? And so um, it tends to focus more narrowly on like overcoming the sin problem at the expense of seeing like it's not just God doesn't want to just overcome the sin problem um, just so that like like we can have a restored personal relationship with him. He wants to do that because he has purposes for us within his wider creation that we're being saved for. Right. And so um, it's actually for our good and for his own glory for both. Right. That it's not just a petty like like yeah, like judging over like a, per, a particular sin that has no further purpose than other than to judge and condemn, right? And that's the problem with like focusing too much on that would be that it, it seems to make that the end game, right? The end game is just like dealing with the sin problem. Well, no, in the Bible, the end, the end game is dealing with the sin problem so that we can be recrafted so that we are like Jesus, so that we're in his image, so that we can actually fill the earth with his glory, so we have to get, catch that other side of salvation to see that we're saved for something or else it will seem just petty. So one of my questions was about um, obedience-based discipleship. Having raised children for the last 20 years, that's something that's on a mom's mind a lot is how can I get my children to obey? How can I get them to want to obey? So that even when I'm not around, even when they're gone, that's what they want to do. Um, but Sometimes we can conflate like um, obedience with acceptance. So, and even in a family context, not just in a gospel context, you know, that I'm, I perform and therefore I'm, I'm accepted. How can we um, guard against that, I guess, and still, because, and still have like a good, robust view of obedience? Because um, I think it's kind of out of fashion these days to really, you know, hammer obedience. You know, that's, that's one of the keys to understanding. That's one of the keys to sanctification, but, and yet keep that balance. 
Yeah, I think you're wise to um, know that there's a difference between obedience and obedience from the heart, right? As, um, yeah, we can all perform, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we, um, yeah, that internally everything is right. Um, yeah, certainly as scripture speaks about this, it, it certainly wants to frame it in a, a, a kind of liberation through the Holy Spirit kind of way, right? That really the key is, I think, an allegiant relationship to the Lord um, so that, you know, we're, as we're performing, it's not like we have a list of, you know, do's and don'ts that are the primary motivation, but it's not as if the do's and don'ts don't matter either, right? Um, that the, the main motivation comes from an appropriate recognition that Jesus is our King, and that we kind of have to always be recentering our loyalty, re, re grabbing back onto that, like, allegiant relationship to Him as the King, and letting that drive the engine. Otherwise, we can end up with a kind of, of like um, pathetic legalism, right? Where we're performing like on the external you know, kind of side of things, um, but internally not nothing's quite right. Um, or uh, we can also end up with a kind of a, a works righteousness where we feel like we we can perform our list of do's or don'ts, and we're we're therefore performing before the Lord and are right before them before the Lord. When in fact that's not what the Lord wants. He wants like He wants a, an appropriate allegiance to Him that drives all that, and He does want us to do the right things. So I think that um, we can only do that with the aid of the spirit. So continually bringing ourselves and, you know, those under our care back to that realization that it's about allegiance to the Lord, uh, that as we confess Jesus is King, God sends the Holy Spirit to his people and that we join into that, right? As we are part of the confessing, you know, body of believers, like we have the Holy Spirit in our lives that will empower us to be obedient from the heart and that there's no other way. Right. So it's a continual confession of allegiance. And that's why I think when we get the gospel right, when we see that it's not just about believing that he died for my sins, but instead confessing he's the king. Right. That helps our discipleship and our obedience based loyalty to Jesus fall into place because it allows the spirit's work in our lives to kind of take center stage. There are going to be some people who who hear this and they're wondering, OK, one of Christianity's. This is a this is a trite way to put it, but one of Christianity's perks is the uh, is the security that we have as believers. It's like I know that I am saved. I know that, uh, that you know that Jesus is my Savior and by grace through faith and and that sort of thing. And so to bring in the element of okay, yes, but it, faith also means allegiance, active allegiance, embodied allegiance to uh, to Jesus. Um, for some people that that's going to make them uneasy thinking, okay, well, does that put into doubt whether or not I am truly saved? What happened to that security? Now I'm feeling some insecurity because today I didn't really function as though Jesus was my Lord, that sort of thing. Um, so how, how would you respond to that? Um, that insecurity of, okay, well, d doesn't that put my salvation into doubt if it isn't just about what Jesus has done for me, but it's also about, uh, you know, faith, which is a, an active part of my daily life. Yeah, I think the question of security is an interesting one, right? As um, I've seen both kind of reactions to, um, yeah, this this new information that people acquire that faith means loyalty or allegiance in certain contexts. Um, and especially when we're talking about responding to the king, it tends to mean that. Right. Um, one reaction that people have had actually is the opposite. Some, some have said, actually, this enhances my security. And I think that's especially true for a certain kind of person, a person who is plagued by um, modern intellectual doubts. Right. The, the Christian narrative is presented to them and they're like, well, I want to have faith. I, I want to believe that to be true. Um, but in light of, you know, all of the swirling worldview options out there. Like there are some days where I believe it to be true and other days where I struggle to believe that it's true. I want to try to make myself believe, but um, I can't seem to conjure that up, right? Um, some people feel that way. And I think actually for them, the message of allegiance is very comforting uh, because even on the days where they have intellectual doubts, they find like, I can still give loyalty to Jesus, my King, even whenever I'm, even on those days where I have like uh, some doubts in my mind intellectually about the Christian narrative, right? I can still be loyal. I can still be allegiant through the midst of those doubts. And uh, some people get imprisoned by those doubts. And, and I, I've even had students who have reported they went to counseling, right? Because they, um, they kept doubting their own belief in Jesus. Like I, I'm trying to trust his atonement. I'm trying to believe in all this, but I just keep struggling. Am I saved? Am I not? Like going to counseling, trying to, to get that worked out for them. And I think the message of allegiance has been comforting. 
Um, on the other hand, I, I think you're right. There are some that are going to be anxious, like, am I allegiance enough, right, becomes their question, right? Like, okay, like you say, I need to be loyal to Jesus and my salvation depends on it. But I'm like, if it depends on me, I'm toast, right, is, is, is the response that those people give. Um, because I fall short every day. I, I'd like to, I'd like to remind those people that the scripture never calls us to uh, or su suggests that we're saved by perfect faith, that like we have to somehow have perfect faith in order to be saved. Why would we then expect that we have to have perfect loyalty? Like um, it seems that we're sort of misconstruing the categories. Um, and um, so what we need to have, I think what scripture calls us to is to confess Jesus as the king, right? That's our faith. That's our loyalty. As long as we persist in that con confession, right? Even if it's an imperfect allegiance we're living out, right? Our overall trajectory, our overall posture, our overall intention, our overall embodied confession, right? Is that Jesus is the king and we're seeking to live that out as imperfect disciples who are in the process, hopefully, of being transformed. Um, and so I think that as we remember that we're not called to a perfect loyalty or a perfect allegiance any more than we would be called to a perfect intellectual faith, right, um, then I think we can also find comfort and realize that, um, yeah, we can be every bit as secure as we would be under other models or understandings of faith. Yeah, that's helpful. The, the idea of the the confession of Jesus as King being central and that it does involve a, a component of the will and not just of on the one hand, intellectual sin on the other hand, an emotional uh, trust um, which obviously, you know, those are important, but, uh, but the, the central is that, that commitment. I, am I hearing you right? You are. And, you know, and that would not be any different from classic Protestant theology. They would also like have said that we need to like the will is involved right in our confession of, of trust in Jesus. Um, but the, the tendency was to disembody that. And I think we're in an era where we're seeing increasingly the evidence is there that the Greek word pistis that's traditionally translated faith is an embodied relational uh, word. It's not something that just happens in our mind, but also is something that our bodies do too. Now, the word can sometimes mean just something mental, uh, but it frequently means something relational and embodied. Um, and so we have to th be thoughtful about that as Christians, right? That we need to not reduce it down to a mental trust, but we need to see it in more rich terms as something that involves trust, but goes beyond it to a bodily allegiance to a king. So you're discipling a kid who, you know, is wanting to get baptized. How does what you're saying here affect that relationship and, and what you what you talk to that kid and maybe even what you have them commit to at their baptism? How does how does all this factor into that disciple making process? Yeah. Um, yeah. If I'm in charge of, of, of baptismal catechesis or instruction like that's going along with um, baptism, I'm going to make it an allegiance ceremony. I'm going to say, like, what you're committing here to is you're committing to Jesus as your king. What you're doing in your act of baptism is you're publicly confessing him. Uh, the word homologeo in Greek um, that attends like confessing the Lord, that kind of language like we find in Romans 10, 9 through 10, right? Um, that language involves a public confession. And we have evidence that early baptisms actually involved a calling upon the name of the Lord. I think that there's good reasons why we would see this as undertaking an oath of allegiance to the Lord. So that um, what you were doing as you um, were baptized in the earliest context would have involved an, a confession that Jesus was your king. Um, so I think we need to recover that practice and that it's helpful for, for those who are thinking about their um, baptism to think about it in terms of I'm making a lifelong commitment to this king. So that's why it would have been considered so subversive and a problem. Um, because you're confessing allegiance to a different king. That's right. Than the one under which you're living. That's right. Yeah. So it's, it's also clarifying, though, to me. I'm just thinking that's just so clarifying. Go ahead. Yeah, I, th I think yeah. In the ancient context, certainly, like the confession that Jesus was the Lord or the King, the Kurios, right? Um, the Basilus, like to use the, the ancient terminology. Uh, everyone was aware there was a different king, right? Like that there was a different Caesar, that there was a different Basilus, whether that be Herod, whether that be Octavian, like in the ancient context. Um, yeah, so the confession that there was this other king uh, was certainly seen as subversive and possibly politically political disloyalty. And, and even so now too. So I'm thinking in our context and, you know, America, where the cultural tide just seems to be um, turning so quickly, which I think probably it wasn't, but it feels quick <laughs> here in the last few years. Um, 
it's clarifying as you go out and do into the world and conduct your business to, um, you know, for the cake baker or for the, um, sports coach, um, and those kinds of things. Um, it, it clarifies to me those cultural issues that we're now trying to face. Okay. Well, I'm a, I'm a citizen of this kingdom. Jesus is my King. When, when this kingdom I'm living in here on earth comes in conflict, clearly this, uh, this is the allegiance I must demonstrate when yeah. it's not in conflict, you, you can go on, but, um, I, we've not had to face that, I guess. And so, um, that this kind of clarity would be critical. I would think as we move forward. Yeah, I do. I do think it helps um, to kind of think in terms of allegiances. And um, one of the great misunderstandings that's happened in the church has has connected to a misunderstanding about Jesus's kingship vis-a-vis -vis the devil's rule, right? As um, you know, there are statements in Scripture that you know the the prince of this age, you know, has rulership, and so people tend to think that well, Satan is um, the the present ruler. Well, this misunderstands the New Testament's presentation of of like of, of how God is breaking in a new creation into the midst of the old and how there's a transfer of ages so that like on the one hand we would want to say Jesus is king over the the kingdom of God era that God is breaking in into the midst of the old era um, so Jesus is genuinely king over that space through the Holy Spirit so as we confess together as the church Jesus is king a new socio political reality is birthed through that confession Jesus is reigning in his church wherever that confession is genuinely like spoken right and that's a new politic that emerges right there so the gospel is political and people tend to misunderstand that and and separation of church and state ideas have confused all this meanwhile satan is the ruler over this old age right that is now passed away. So we need to understand Jesus's kingship is a, a reality right now. And I think confusion around that um, has caused problems for the church. And that parallels personal um, salvation as well. So it's like an already thing. Like, so it's a moment in time, but it's a process. And then there's a finish line when we see him face to face. It really is very much in, in tandem to me, large scale creation and humanity. You yeah. should look about this. You're really good. Oh, wait, you already have. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's really clarifying. We've only been talking 30 minutes and it's really, really beautifully clarifying and, and just takes you right. The cross is what we've heard, you know, over and over and over and over again. And the cross is important, but this is so much bigger and more beautiful, more pervasive and more aligned with what's happening with us. Yeah, I, I agree. It, it kind of helps us to see why, yeah, the gospel impinges on our, our daily life, right? In a way that it's not, it's not just salvation for the by and by, right? It's, it's about um, a new sociopolitical reality right now that emerges through the Holy Spirit as Jesus has confessed. Let's talk about grace. So you said earlier that you would like to kind of tweak some people's understanding of grace. And what I'm guessing is, when you when you tweak people's understanding of grace, that's like really core, and you might end up with a lot of backlash and a lot of straw man uh, of of what you're saying. So so what would you uh, first of all? What is grace, and uh, you know how how has it how has your your um, definition of grace been misconstrued by people who uh, aren't buying into the the gospel allegiance um, method or, or or story? Yeah, well. Um Grace is a multifaceted idea, and that's part of what makes it complex, is that it's often been treated as a sort of one-dimensional thing. Um, I would point people to the really helpful work of John Barclay in his book, Paul and the Gift, where he, he unpacks six different dimensions of grace. And he shows that grace um, in antiquity um, was understood differently than how grace has been understood theologically through the time period of the Reformation and today. So he he's really helpful in showing how different ideas of grace have shifted over time. Um, so our basic ideas about grace tend to be that um, it's actually like when we get something that we don't deserve. That's like our foundational ideas about grace. Um, interestingly, that's actually not the normal view of grace in antiquity. Um, the normal view of gift giving or graces in antiquity was that you give people, you give things only to the people who deserve it. So actually it's actually the, the normal idea of grace is the exact opposite almost um, of uh, in, in, in terms of the, the, the worldview around the Bible 
as what it's been come to mean in terms of popular theology. So that's interesting, right? Um, so that um, actually grace was what you gave to somebody, a gift you gave, but you usually only gave it to the deserving, right? And that actually makes sense to us. Like we don't, uh, when we think about it, like if you're going to give a gift, a grace to, a, um, you know, you want to help somebody who's poor and addicted, uh, do you give money directly to them or do you give it to um, a homeless shelter? Well, you probably more often will give at least a large amount to a homeless shelter because you realize they deserve it. They're good stewards, right? They deserve the grace. They deserve the gift. So on, we don't tend to use grace for that. Um, but in the ancient world, it was used to describe deserved gift giving. Um, so that would be just one way in which we've like misunderstood like the foundational nature of gift giving. Another way we've misunderstood it is that grace demanded reciprocation in antiquity. So that if somebody gave a gift, you needed to give a give give a gift back in order to acknowledge the receipt of the gift. Otherwise, you'd rejected it. So, for example, um, uh, in the ancient world, uh, if you gave me a birthday gift, like that was, let's say, a really nice one, you give me a new car, okay, you're really generous. Um, if I, in response to that, was like, well, that's just really nice of you, and I don't really say anything, and I just kind of um, accept the gift, um, I've, I've insulted you as a gift giver. Like, what I need to do is I need to keep the circle of grace going. And one way I could do that would be through a public benefit. Like, I could, like, do something to publicly praise you. That's a return gift um, that is a different kind of gift. I don't need to give you a car in return. But I need to do something to reciprocate the gift giving. Otherwise, I've rejected it. This connects to patron-client relationships in the ancient uh, world and how gift giving worked in patron-client relationships. So, again, a major difference would be we tend to think that a pure gift is the best gift. One with no strings attached. That was actually not true at all in antiquity. It was actually the opposite idea. They believed that only grace could, could only be uh, grace if, in fact, the circle of gift giving was perpetuated in some way. Uh, there's much, much more I could say about grace, um, but that just gives you a, a little snippet into how ancient ideas about grace were quite different from um, ideas about grace in a lot of contemporary theology. And so against that backdrop, the so grace as used in the new testament um basically the same way or was it pretty revolutionary how, how does how, what is grace in the new testament up against the backdrop you just described yeah so uh one of the things that is interesting about the new testament is it does emphasize the unmerited nature of god's gift to us um and this is actually an unusual conception of grace for antiquity that like god would give it to humanity even though humanity doesn't deserve it that's not how ordinarily ordinarily gift giving works um, but this is how it does seem to work in the New Testament. Paul stresses that God gives gifts, even though we don't deserve it. Um, I think the problem is that we have tended to abstract that and make grace sort of this plastic thing. When Paul mostly has in view with his grace language, co the concrete gift that he's already given. What is grace for Paul? It's actually the gospel itself is mostly what grace means. It's that God has acted. He has already given the gift. He's given the gift. And what is the gift? It's the gift of, of the king and, his, and what the king has done and those possible benefits that could accrue to you. What do you need to do to respond to the grace? What do you have to give back to acknowledge the gift? What you give back is your loyalty to the king, right? And as you give back your, your faith or your loyalty to the king, then the, then the benefits flow of, of, of the gift of, God, of the kingship, right? That's when you receive right standing with God. Uh, you receive adoption into his family. So really, um, it does align with ancient ideas about grace quite well, other than that Paul and uh, our other New Testament authors seem to emphasize that God gave this gift to humanity apart from humans deserving it. But it's a historical understanding, mostly. Like, that gift's already been given. What happens is that it, it gets dehistoricized, and so that grace becomes this plastic term that means, like, um, we could never do anything on our own or something along those lines without violating grace because it's a timeless concept. It's mostly a time-bound concept in the New Testament uh, that God gives his grace at a specific time through Christ events. So it's not just a vague principle of you know, of, of an excuse to be able to live however you want. It, it is tied very directly to Jesus' kingship. That's right. So we're right to be thinking of grace as um, both, like not either or, but like unmerited favor from God. So it's by grace you've been saved through faith, that that thing, that verse. And then, and, but but we do reciprocate. I mean, that's, that's evidence that we actually have faith, right? I mean, we're told to test ourselves. Look at your actions, test yourself. 
like you should, that should be your testimony to yourself that you're reciprocating this grace that God's extended to you. Would you say that that would be right? Yeah, that's, that's fair to say. Yeah. When Paul talks about, um, you know, for by grace, you're saved through faith. Like, yeah, he actually has already defined grace. If you look back, I mean, those verses always get quoted Ephesians, you know, the two, eight through 10, uh, yeah. Paul actually, uh, a couple verses earlier actually defines grace and he defines it in terms of, of Jesus's exaltation and kingship. Uh, interestingly. Um, so um, yeah, there are some connections to um, the historicity of self, uh, of Christ saving actions, but yeah, we don't have to choose uh, between the two in the sense that like, yeah, we don't have to say that like, it's not that, yeah, we're not, I'm not saying that humans don't like somehow have deserved God's grace. Obviously they haven't. Right. right. But I think the emphasis in the new Testament on is that humanity as a whole was in a, in deep, a deep pickle. Right. And God <laughs> acted in his grace historically 2000 years ago and, and offered us salvation in Christ. And then we have the opportunity to respond to that by giving our loyalty or our faith to Jesus as King. And as we respond with loyalty, then the benefits that accompany that kingship flow into our lives. So yeah, it's unmer an unmerited gift, but we're not talking about just an abstract gift as if somehow the problem is that like, I'm really trying to earn my salvation, but I shouldn't be. And I need to just trust in Jesus well, there's some truth to that, but that's not really Paul's point. Like that's that's what happens when we dehistoricize that and we misunderstand what grace is. We misunderstand what faith is. We actually misunderstand what works are. Um, yeah, if you want more on that, like any interested reader, I, I go through that all in detail in my book, Gospel Allegiance, and 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 discuss this passage, Ephesians two eight through ten, uh, in in with more nuance. So we're about to close. Um, one question I have is: okay, the gospel means good news. For you personally, uh, what is really, really good about the news that you've been writing about? What, what personally is like, man, this, this is worth uh, entrusting my whole, my whole life to. This, this, is, this is truly the good news. I think at the top of the list for me would be that I'm not the king of my own life. That's good news for me because I'm a little bit neurotic and I, um, I probably have um, obsessive compulsive tendencies a little bit. I'm, I'm a recovering engineer. I used to be an engineer uh, in my previous life before being a theologian. Um, and I think for me, like I can, um, I can become very obsessive over certain kinds of things. Um, and I realize that's unhealthy. Um, and like, I have a kind of addictive personality in that way. Um, and yeah, giving over myself to Jesus's kingship and allowing him to run my life um, I think is truly good news for me um, as I realize I'm a bad tyrant. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Thank you so much for being with us. This has been really helpful. And I would really encourage if, if that people who are watching this have not gotten your book, Gospel Allegiance, to get it um, where we, you can go into more detail than we were able to do today. Thank you, Renee. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. Yeah.